All right, so the stuff that we're looking at today is going to be uh, useful to us for Thursday's lab. On Thursday, when we go into the lab, you are going to have at the front of the room about a dozen unknown compounds. Some of them will be ionic. Some of them will be molecular. Okay, And all they will be labeled with is a letter. What you will be expected to do using what we go over today and your amazing brain is to be able to identify each one of those one dozen compounds. Okay, like actually tell me this one's copper two sulfate, this one is nickel two chloride, this one is water, this one's ethyl alcohol. Okay, and be able to tell me which one is which just based on their simple physical properties. Okay, so what we're going over today are the physical properties of both ionic and molecular compounds. Okay, and hopefully that will help. Okay, well, it's going to help okay, uh, with your identification of the materials on Thursday. Then we'll talk a little bit about what kind of tests we're going to be running in order to identify those um, unknown compounds uh, and why they're going to work. Okay, so that's going to be the bulk of today is talking about properties of compounds, tests we're going to run in the lab, okay, and why we're going to do that. Okay, so we're going to learn the properties of compounds, acids, bases, ionic compounds, molecular compounds. Okay, understand how these properties can be used to identify one. Okay, and that'll be useful for your lab design. All right, so all matters got properties. Some properties are physical properties, and some properties are chemical properties. Okay, today we're going to focus on just the physical properties. These are the ones that a compound can show you basically without reacting with anything, okay? Anytime a compound reacts with something else, that's a chemical property because it leads to a chemical change, okay? Physical properties are just the things that you could readily observe about a compound without putting it in anything other than water, okay? All right, so uh, reactivity, like we said, that's a chemical uh, property, okay? Some are physical, like color, density, melting points, Okay, um, solubility, okay, is another one. Specific heat capacity is another one, okay. Um, whether or not a compound's solution will conduct electricity, okay, is a physical, comp is a physical property. And we're gonna be going over quite a few of these and how they're going to help us, okay. But obviously color, density, odor, okay, is another physical property, okay? Uh, anything basically, like I said, that you can readily observe about a compound without mixing it with anything, okay? All right. Now, for ionic compounds, okay, one of the most important things about ionic compounds is that they typically exist as crystalline solids at room temperature, okay? They have very high melting points, hundreds of degrees Celsius before they will melt. Right. Now, does that mean every crystalline solid you see is an ionic compound? It doesn't, okay? Because sugar is a crystalline solid and it's molecular, okay? Uh, so what I mean here is uh, sugar's molecular formula is C6H12O6, okay? Does that have any metals in it? It's all non-metals, okay? So it's a molecular compound, all right? But it does exist as a crystalline solid at room temperature, okay? Now, if something is a crystalline solid at room temperature, there is a very good chance it would be an ionic compound, okay? Not 100%, but a good chance it would be an ionic compound, okay? Um, ionic compounds, another important thing, is that they will conduct electricity when they are in solution, okay? So if I have, let's say, salt and sugar side by side, okay, and I'm not allowed to taste them because in the lab, taste tests are not allowed, okay, for obvious reasons. Some of the things are not good for you, okay, and they're all unknown, okay, but if I had those two side by side, okay, yeah, sugar and salt, they look a lot alike. I mean, they have slight differences, but it's pretty hard to tell them apart just by looking at them. They don't, either one of them really have a smell, Okay. So the only way I'd be able to tell one from the other is that one is ionic because salt is sodium chloride and one is molecular. 
Okay? If I dissolved them both in water, one of them would have their solution conduct electricity, and the other wouldn't. Okay? And the reason that ionic compounds will conduct electricity in solution is because of what we talked about the other day. They're charged particles. They trade electrons, and once they've traded their electrons, there's no need for them to stay together. So when they dissolve in solution, they separate. And you can see in this diagram here that we've got a sodium atom, or ion, sorry, that is positively charged, surrounded by water, and a chlorine ion that is negatively charged, surrounded by water. This would be a big chunk of salt that's still dissolving. Okay? But as that salt dissolves, okay, the sodium and the chlorine separate into charged particles with a bunch of charged particles floating around, the solution will conduct electricity. If you put sugar into water, it doesn't do that. It dissolves, but it doesn't separate. Okay? Because it doesn't separate into charged particles, there are no charged particles to carry the current. Okay? So as a result, molecular compounds do not conduct electricity when dissolved in water. Okay? All right, now what would that mean for Water. Is water ionic or molecular? It's molecular. Even though hydrogen is listed first, okay, and we always say that when hydrogen is listed first, it's behaving as a metal, except in water. Get used to that. Except with water. Except with water. Water is the exception that proves every rule. Okay? It's, it's always the exception. It does all kinds of weird things. Okay? But water is actually a molecular compound, and pure distilled water does not conduct electricity. Okay? Does tap water conduct electricity? Yes, yes it does. Because okay? it's full of all kinds of ions, calcium especially, some chlorine, okay? things like that. Okay? That's what makes our water hard, okay? with all the calcium that's in it. Okay. Um, but it does, tap water does conduct electricity because it does have ions dissolved in it. All right, uh, so that's what this is saying here. This is due to the nature of the positive and negative ions that make up these compounds. All right, so if I have a substance, it's a crystalline solid, and I dissolve it in water, and that solution conducts electricity, is it definitely ionic? Yes. Okay. In fact, your one definitive test to determine whether a compound is ionic or molecular is a conductivity test. That will always tell you this one's molecular, this one's ionic. Molecular compounds do not conduct electricity in water okay, or in solution. Ionic compounds do. Okay? So that's an important one to use when you're determining whether something is ionic or molecular. Now, some ionic compounds are also brightly colored. Certain metals, when they are part of ionic compounds, create certain colors. Okay? Um, nickel, for example, okay, is always green. Any nickel containing com ionic compound is going to be green in color. Okay? Um, the, the shades can differ depending on what the nickel is with, okay? but they're always going to be green. Okay? Similarly, Okay? Anything containing copper is going to be blue. Again, different shades of blue, but copper containing compounds are always blue. Okay? And cobalt containing compounds are anywhere from pink to red. Okay? It's like we have some, the one that we're going to have is like blood red. Okay? And some are really faded pink. Okay? But they're all pink to reddish color if they contain cobalt. All right? So, if I have an, uh, an unknown compound on Thursday, okay, it's a green crystalline solid, it dissolves easily in water, it conducts electricity, it probably contains nickel. Okay? Now, I would not put more than one compound that contained nickel in there. Okay? That would be a way for you to identify that compound. Okay? Everybody kind of following the process that we're going to use on Thursday? Okay. We're just kind of going through here are the physical properties of each one and what do these physical properties fit with? Because I will give you a list. I didn't think I mentioned that before. So you'll have all these unknown compounds and then I'll have a list of possible identities. So you won't have to guess. Okay? So, oh, hey, that's a green crystalline solid. It's probably that one. That, that one's blue. It's probably that one. Okay? Then you run the, the tests to confirm. Okay? 
Okay. Okay. Everybody with me so far? All right. Now, um, sorry. Before we get to molecular compounds, another strange one. Okay. This stuff on your table of polyatomic ions is called ammonium. Okay. Ammonium containing compounds typically will have spherical crystals. And decrease in temperature when they dissolve in water. Okay. In fact, how many people have ever used one of those instant cold packs for an injury where you pop the little water bladder inside and you shake it up? Okay. The stuff that's in there, the little, the little bladder is obviously full of water, okay. but the stuff that's in there is ammonium nitrate. Okay, that's the crystallized stuff that you can hear rattling around inside. It's little tiny kind of off-white spherical crystals. Okay, and um, when it re when it dissolves in water, it decreases in temperature fairly rapidly. So anything containing NH4 okay, is going to have spherical crystals and decrease in temperature when dissolved. Okay, questions so far on that? By the way, if I write something down, should you? Definitely. Okay. If I'm adding it to what I had, you should add it to what you have. Okay. I think that's spoiler alert. Super important for Thursday. Now, for molecular compounds, we talked about this just a minute ago. Okay. If I'm looking at an ionic compound, I'm looking at um, compounds made up of charged particles, positives and negatives, positives and negatives. That's usually what leads to the crystalline structure is because they have to be oriented a certain way to limit the amount of repulsion okay, between the, the like charges. Whereas molecular compounds don't have that problem. They don't have charges. They're not made of charged particles. So they're typically not crystalline, although there are a few exceptions, sugar being one of them. Okay? They typically have a softer or waxier appearance if they're a solid, okay? but they don't have to be, okay? because most molecular compounds have fairly low melting points. Okay? Uh, for example, um, coconut oil. Some people ever use coconut oil. Okay? If, you ever, if you put coconut oil on your hand, what happens to it? It'll melt. Yeah. Like it's a solid at room temperature, but about 32 degrees or so is its melting point. So if you put it in your hand, it'll melt. Okay. I remember we had uh, when we had the a um, few years ago we had all those days when it was so hot. Okay, we didn't have air conditioning in our house, and I pulled coconut oil out of the pantry, and the whole container was liquid. Okay, it had gotten that hot in the house that the whole container of coconut oil had melted. Okay, coconut oil is a molecular compound. Okay, at room temperature it's a solid, but it's like soft and waxy. Okay, candle wax, another one. Okay, that's a uh, a molecular compound. It's a solid at room temperature, but it's fairly soft. Okay, uh, butter. They would be another one. Okay, any type of oil, canola oil, vegetable oil, whatever. Okay, they're all molecular compounds. Okay, and molecular compounds can be solids, liquids, or gases at room temperature. Okay, carbon dioxide. Okay, is a molecular compound. It's a gas at room temperature. Okay, methane. Fart gas, okay? That's a, a gas at room temperature, right? So if you have something that is a liquid and is an unknown compound on Thursday, it's definitely not what? It's definitely not ionic, okay? There are no ionic compounds that are liquids at room temperature, okay? So if you have a liquid, you know it's definitely one of your molecular compounds. You can eliminate more than half of the unknowns right away just by knowing it's liquid. There are no gases. Okay? There will be no unknown compounds that are gases. They're just incredibly hard to keep in a beaker. Okay? So there won't be any gases. Okay, so molecular compounds can be solids, liquids, or gases at room temperature. They have low melting and boiling points. They are not usually as soluble as ionic compounds. 
okay? If I had sugar and salt side by side, I'd be able to dissolve way more salt in, in the same amount of water than it would sugar, okay? You know this if you've ever tried to make like Kool-Aid or anything like that, okay? Um, I know, like, I make it with hot water. Okay? That way, I can put lots and lots of sugar in it, and more of the sugar will dissolve, and then I put it in the fridge to cool it off, and I know it's good when there's that layer of sugar at the bottom of the container, okay? Because I know it's saturated, you can't hold it anymore. So they're not usually as soluble, okay? Um, and they obviously don't conduct electricity. We talked about that, okay? But um, those are two of the things we want to look for, okay? Typically, your molecular compounds won't dissolve in water. I mean, we know oil floats on top of water, okay? You can't dissolve a candle by putting it in a glass of water, okay? It just doesn't dissolve, okay? They're not soluble, okay, for the most part. Okay, questions there? The other thing about molecular compounds is they typically are not brightly colored. They're typically dull, okay? Whites, grays, okay? Uh, maybe faded yellows sometimes, okay? But they're not typically brightly colored. Okay. And when they dissolve in water, they typically produce clear solutions. You dissolve sugar in water, it makes a clear solution. Uh, alcohol, okay, There's another one. So if we had like ethyl alcohol, that's C2H5OH, okay? That's the stuff that's in booze, okay? Um, that stuff, soluble in water, okay? If you pour it into water, it completely disappears, okay? Well, it doesn't disappear, it's still in there, but you can't see it, okay, if it's, if it's clear, okay? Um, so they typically will produce clear solutions if they're soluble in water. Okay, now we're gonna talk about acids, okay? There's two kinds of acids, strong acids and weak acids, okay? Typically, weak acids are formed from molecular compounds, okay? Citric acid, okay, is a molecular compound. It's a very weak acid, okay? It's stuff that's in fruit, okay? Hydrochloric acid is an ionic compound, okay? And even at you know, reasonably dilute concentrations can still be harmful, okay? It's the stuff that's in your stomach that helps you to digest food, okay? It's very good at breaking down things, okay? How does it not eat through your stomach? Anybody know? It can, actually, okay? That's what an ulcer is. If you know anyone who's had an ulcer, okay? An ulcer is when the hydrochloric acid in your stomach actually starts to digest your stomach. It makes a chemical burn on the inside of your stomach, okay? Uh, that's usually caused uh, by a number of different conditions that lead to the deterioration of this mucus layer, okay? The inside of your stomach is covered in snot, okay? A protective layer of mucus at all times that keeps the hydrochloric acid from burning it, okay? Um, all kinds of things can lead to the deterioration of that. Uh, stress, okay, uh, can lead to that. Alcoholism, okay, can lead to that because the mucus tends to be more soluble in alcohol, okay. Uh, things like that can all lead to the deterioration of that layer, okay. It's just typically why people who have really high stress jobs tend to develop ulcers more, um, or people who are alcoholics also tend to develop ulcers, okay. Um, but, yeah, it's strong stuff. We're going to talk mainly about strong acids, and strong acids are ionic compounds where hydrogen is acting as the metal, okay? So strong acids are going to contain hydrogen as an ion acting as the metal, so H plus, right? So that would be the one we just talked about. Hydrogen chloride, which we call hydrochloric acid, okay? It's an ionic compound. Chlorine's the minus, hydrogen's the plus, Okay, and what happens with acids is they are incredibly soluble in water, and when they are so, when they dissolve, they split into H plus and whatever they're attached to. Okay, and those H plus ions lower the pH, okay, down into way down into the acidic range. All right, the more H plus that an acid can free up or deliver when it dissolves, the more acidic it's going to be, okay? So this stuff, 
is worse than hydrogen chloride. Okay? Hydrogen sulfide, when it goes into water, can give off how many hydrogen? How many hydrogen are in it? Two. Okay? So hydrogen sulfide okay, is going to be more acidic at the same concentration okay, as hydrogen chloride, because hydrogen chloride can only give off one hydrogen, where this can give off two. Okay? Similarly with this. Okay? That can give off two as well. Right? This stuff's really bad. Nitric acid. Even getting the fumes on your skin can cause chemical burns. So it's really nasty stuff. Okay. okay, everybody with me there? So, ionic compounds where hydrogen is acting as the metal are going to be strong acids. So on Thursday, if one of your unknowns comes back with a pH of like one, okay. It's definitely an ionic compound, and it's probably going to have what in it? Hydrogen, acting as a metal. Okay, so you'd want to look through your possible identities and see if you have anything that looks like this. Okay, these would all be acids. Okay. And uh, just so you know, I do tend to mix things fairly concentrated. I like my results to be very clear. Okay. I don't, I don't like the measure. I just pour until I think it's good. So everything's going to be uber strong. So just be careful when you're handling it all. Because right? uh, I once had, uh, when I was making up the stuff for this lab years and years ago, I was uh, standing over the hydrochloric acid, and I sneezed. And when you sneeze, what do you do right after? You sharply inhale. Well, yeah, yes, you do that too. But you sharply inhale after you sharply exhale. And I inhaled the fumes. Flat on my back, bleeding from the nose. Yeah. Stuff's bad. That was like the sample jar. It's like seven molar super, like nation concentrated. You won't have that. Okay? <laughs> I won't give that stuff to you. That's the stuff where if you spill it on the on the counter, there'll be a hole shortly thereafter. So I won't give it to you that strong. Okay? But it's still gonna be strong enough. Right? So you wanna be, you wanna treat everything with respect because you don't know what everything is. That's why there's no taste okay. tests. Okay? You taste test my hydrochloric acid, it'll leave you hollow inside. Okay? So we don't want to do that. All right. Um, so with these acids, okay, things we need to know, okay, acids are ionic compounds. And because they dissociate, that is when they dissolve, they split apart really easily, these are going to be some of your best conductors. Okay? They're ionic compounds and they split into their charged particles really easily, so their, their solutions will be highly conductive. Okay, and they'll have really low pHs. Okay, so they'll turn the litmus paper to the acidic colors, the red colors. Okay, um, so they're crystalline solids, highly soluble in water. We can't even get these in their solid form. Okay, it's way too dangerous to have this stuff in its solid form. Okay, so I will let you know which one of the unknowns is dissolved in water already for you. Okay? Otherwise, you'll think it's a liquid. Okay, but we can't have it as a solid. Okay, acids taste sour or tart? No, taste tart. Okay? But typically, things that are acidic are sour or tart. Think about a lemon or a lime, okay? even oranges. Okay? I mean, they're sweet, but they're kind of, you know, they're acidic. Okay? So we've got um, that there. Okay? So acids are typically going to be sour or tart. Vinegar is an acid. Okay? It's very tart. Okay? Um, and they'll turn our litmus indicators to acidic colors. Okay? And they have a low pH less than 7. Questions on acids. Okay. If something comes up as a pH of five, is it really acidic? No. It's slightly acidic. Okay. Normal rainwater has a pH of about four and a half to five. Okay. And it's not gonna you know, peel the skin off your bones. Right? So you don't have to worry about something in that range. But if you've got something that's three or lower, that's definitely getting into the strong acid range. Okay? It's okay to have stuff that's mildly acidic or mildly basic. Okay? You're going to have lots of things that are in that range. Okay? But when you start getting three and lower or on the basic side, 
like 11 or higher, okay, then you're starting to deal with a strong acid or a strong base. All right. Now, sorry, um, we said that the acids all have H plus in them, okay? Bases are the opposite. Bases are going to have high pHs, and all bases have this in them. Polyatomic ions. OHs. Hydroxide. Okay? So anything that contains hydroxide as the non-metal is going to be very basic. Okay? Um, this stuff, for example, sodium hydroxide is a very strong base. It's what's in oven cleaner. Okay, so if you've ever used that white foamy stuff on the inside of your oven, it has a very characteristic smell. Okay, that's very caustic, that smell. Okay, if you inhale that, it's very bad for your lungs and your sinus cavities and stuff. It's very, very basic. That's why it can eat the crud off the inside of your oven. Okay, so we use that stuff because a strong base can be just as corrosive as a strong acid. Okay, if people get this idea that bases aren't harmful, but acids are, okay, Bases are just as harmful. Okay? They're just as corrosive. Okay? Um, I don't know if you've seen, like, you ever watched any like, like those crime shows, but when people are trying to dispose of a body, they always have a bag of lime. Okay? That's a strong base. Okay? You throw it on there and it dissolves organic material. I'm not telling you how to dispose of a body. But that's pretty common knowledge. But um, yeah, it's, if you have a strong base, it's just as acidic, or sorry, just as caustic or corrosive okay, as a strong base. So anything that contains OH, Okay, is going to be basic. And it's going to be what kind of a compound? Ionic, exactly. Okay, I mean, if it's got a polyatomic ion in it, it's got to be ionic. Okay, so strong bases are going to behave just like strong acids. They're going to easily dissolve in water. They're going to conduct electricity really well, but they're going to have a high pH as opposed to a very low one, okay? So if you're looking at anything that's 11 or higher, that's a really strong base, okay? Anything above seven is technically a base, okay? But anything that's 11 or higher is gonna be a strong base. The, the pH scale only goes from one to 14, okay? So 14 would be your strongest base, one would be your strongest acid. Okay, bases typically taste bitter, again, trying to taste any of these things, but they do typically taste bitter, okay? Soap contains lye, okay? That's the stuff people use, you know, bag of lime, okay? Um, that's the stuff that's in that, okay? It's a, it's a strong base, okay? Um, and it can help to dissolve oils, okay? The whole purpose of having um, that strong base in soap is that it helps to dissolve the oils on your skin, okay? And help you get clean up. Okay, so they will turn litmus indicators to blue, okay? And there's their solutions will conduct electricity because strong bases are ionic compounds and they're going to have a pH of higher than 7. So on Thursday, if you're doing your pH test and you've got one that turns that thing bluish black, okay, that means it's going to have a really high pH. You need to go back to your list of unknowns and look for something that contains OH. Okay, that is what kind of compound? Ionic. Yeah, it contains hydroxide. Here's the problem: is you could have something like this. Okay, C2H5OH. Okay, is that an ionic compound? Does it have a metal in it? No. Okay, and in fact, this compound doesn't actually have. OH hydroxide in it, okay? It has an oxygen and a hydrogen off on a separate group, it's not an ion, okay? But it looks like it has OH in it, but I can tell it's not a strong base because it's not an ionic compound, okay? A strong base is gonna have to be an ionic compound containing OH, okay? Remember, C2H5OH is alcohol, okay? It's not, you know, a strong base. Okay, questions on the strong bases? All right, 
Um, so I'm going to give you guys a quick break here, and then I'm going to start going over some of the tests we're going to run on Thursday. You're going to want to write these down, these tests, okay? Um, and kind of, and I'll talk about how we're going to run them. Okay, you'll want to have some notes on that as well, because you guys actually have to design the procedure for Thursday's lab. Okay, well, I'll tell you what tests you're going to run. You just have to give the instructions on how to do it. All right, so we'll give you a couple minute break here, and then we'll talk about that. Okay. So as we said, on Thursday, you're going to get about a dozen unknown compounds just at the front of the room. Okay? You're going to be able to perform certain tests on those. Okay? Um, some observations will be more important than others for certain compounds, and some observations will be important for all of them. Okay? The most important observations that you can make for your unknown compounds are the simplest ones. Okay? And we call that the observable properties test. Okay, your most basic physical properties are the ones you can observe with just your own senses. Okay, with the exception of this. Okay. Um, what's something I can tell just by looking at an unknown compound? Color, yeah. Okay, color is definitely something I'm going to want to make note of. Okay, because we already know there's several ionic compounds that have obvious bright colors: blue, green, and red. Okay, for um, copper, nickel, and cobalt. Okay, so I know if I've got something that's one of those colors, it's a good chance that that unknown material has those metals in it, and I can go back to my list of unknowns and pretty much know right away. Okay? So color would certainly be an important observable property that we would want to make note of. Okay? What's another one? Bubbles. What's that? Bubbles. Um, well, hopefully none of them are bubbling. But it, that would be important for the next lab, because if, if we had uh, bubbling going on, it would mean a chemical reaction is occurring. Right? So that would be a sign of a chemical change. Something. Yeah, if that's going on, we definitely want to make a note of it. Okay? Smell. Okay. Um, now, smell is going to okay, uh, be something that will be helpful for probably two of your unknown compounds. But it will be the most helpful one for those two. Okay? Because the smells are obvious and familiar, okay? most likely. Okay? Uh, to give you an idea, right, um, one of your unknown compounds is going to be ethyl alcohol. Okay. Does alcohol have a def definite smell? It does. I mean, if you ever smelled rubbing alcohol or any other kind of alcohol, okay, it has a definite smell. That's why the police will, you know, if they pull somebody over, they're, they're like, they get right next to your face, okay, and they're trying to smell your breath. Okay. The alcohol, and you can smell it, okay, on somebody who's been drinking it. Okay. Uh, it has a definite kind of strong antiseptic kind of smell to it. Okay. Um, and also, acids typically have a vinegar-like smell. Okay. So those are going to be smells that we we'll probably want to, you know, be on the lookout for. Okay. Strong, obvious. another one. Oh, sorry, I thought your hand was going up. Mm -hmm. Okay, we said ionic compounds are always what? At room temperature. Solid. Solid and crystalline, right? So I would probably want to make note of Is it a solid or a liquid? Because if it's a liquid, we know it's what kind of compound? Molecular, yeah. Okay, so that'll be an important one. Okay, um, so. Is 
Okay, now that doesn't mean all the solids are going to be ionic. Many of them are. Okay, but there are some solids that are unknown in that lab that are going to be molecular as well. Okay, um, now we said they're solid, but they're also crystalline. So we might want to make make a note about the nature of it. something like that. Okay, you want to make a, a note about the nature of the solid or the nature of the liquid. Okay, I mean, if something's a liquid, we would probably want to say clear or cloudy. Okay, depending on what type of liquid it is. Okay, we want to make a note of that. Okay, any other things that would be kind of readily observable? How should I test for smell? Should I put my face over the sample and just go, please don't, or you'll end up like I did, okay, on at least one of them, okay? You'll be flat on your back, bleeding from the nose, okay? We don't want that, okay? So, you need to waft the samples, okay? That means put it about this far from your face and do this, okay? Waft the odor towards you. Remember, I made them all really strong. The odors will be obvious if they have any. Okay? If you're doing this and you can't smell anything, then it doesn't smell. All right? If you're doing this and it has a smell, you'll know. Okay? I'll make them that way to make sure. All right? So we definitely want to make sure that we are wafting. That's what that's called. Okay? That could be something that might be important when you're designing your procedure, like you know, telling people how not to die while doing your lab. Okay? Make sure to waft these samples, okay? not snort them. All right, so those would be our important observable properties, okay, that we would want to um, look for, all right? So when you're designing your procedure starting tomorrow, okay, uh, when you're talking about the observable properties test, you're going to want to describe to people, here are the things you're looking for. Here's what to look for. Here's how to look for it. Okay, so like wafting the materials. Okay, look uh, in, at any liquids. Look to see whether they are clear or cloudy. Okay, looking at the, the solids. Are they waxy? Are they crystalline? Are they colored? Okay, all of those kind of things will be things you want to tell people to make observations about. Okay, once we've observed those things, okay, there's a couple of other tests we're going to want to run. Okay, one of those is solubility. Okay. We need to know whether these substances dissolve in water or not, because we know ionic compounds typically dissolve easily, and molecular compounds typically don't. Okay. So we want to run a solubility test. disappears yeah okay uh, in a lot of cases anyway it disappears okay I would just especially if it was a, a clear liquid dissolving in another clear liquid they're gonna be both be gone okay um, but if it's a solid and it's dissolving in water okay there's a possibility the solution could still be clear but could it be colored right? if I dissolve blue crystals in distilled water chances are my solution is gonna be blue it would probably still be clear but it'll be blue, okay? If I'm dissolving something that's only a little bit soluble, okay, then the solution might be a little cloudier. And what might I see at the bottom? If something doesn't dissolve really well, yeah, there'll be particles on the bottom, right? Not all of it will dissolve and settle to the bottom. Okay? Now, that's not always meaning it doesn't dissolve well. It could also mean you don't have a lot of water, okay? Um, but typically, if you've got something that's gonna float on the solution, is it soluble? 
Okay? If it sinks, it could be soluble. It's just saturated. It's taken in all it can take. Okay? But if it floats, definitely it's not soluble, especially if it's a liquid. Okay? If you've got one liquid floating on top of another, then they're not soluble in each other. Right? So those would be things when you're describing how to do the solubility test that you would mention. Look for these things. These are signs that something is soluble. These are signs that something isn't soluble. Okay? And we also have to watch during a solubility test for temperature changes. Okay, I forgot to tell you this when we were talking about acids and bases. But when you add acids and bases to water, the temperature goes up. A lot of times, quite a bit. Okay, so. and strong bases when mixed with water will increase in temperature. So much so that when I make the solutions, okay, I have to pour the acids into water and not the other way around. Okay? Water has the ability to absorb a lot of heat and not change its temperature very much. Acid does not. If I add that water to acid, the temperature can increase so much that it can sometimes cause the container to rupture. Okay? So you never want to add water to acid. You always want to go the other way. Add acid to water. Okay? Water has a better ability to absorb the, the heat. Okay? Uh, same with bases. And the other thing we want to watch for is this. Solutions that contain or compounds that contain ammonium will decrease in temperature. solubility test can tell us more than whether something is soluble or not. Okay? It can tell us whether it's a strong acid or a strong base without a pH test. And it can tell us whether it contains ammonium ions or not. Okay. Earlier we said there's one test that will always tell you whether a substance is ionic or molecular. What was that test? Ionic compounds will do this in solution, but the other one. Conduct electricity. Okay, so we want to run a conduct and what we call an aqueous conductivity test. <coughs> Basically, we want to test all the solutions we just made in the solubility test to see whether they conduct electricity. Right? We have a little conductivity meter that you will have okay, that you can use to test the conductivity of each solution. Okay? I'll show you all the stuff tomorrow when we're doing our lab procedure design and stuff. Ionic compounds are going to have a conductivity of 6 to 10. Okay. Molecular compounds okay, are going to be uh, like typically 4 or less. Okay. 
And for that test, you simply take the pH paper, the hydrail paper, okay? You dip it in the solutions, and then you look at what color it changes to, okay? On the side of the pH paper containers is a color code, okay? And you just match the color of the paper up to the uh, color code, and it'll tell you what pH it is, right? The majority of your stuff will be between, like, 8 and 5, okay? Somewhere in there, okay? Most will be between 8 and 5, right? You'll have only a few, okay? Like, for sure two that are going to be way outside of that. Okay. You'll, have, you'll have one unknown that's going to be like a 14 and one unknown that's going to be a one. Okay. Everything else sits somewhere in the middle. Okay. All right, so those are the tests that we're going to run okay, that'll help us to identify whether a compound is ionic or molecular and then hopefully lead us to its actual identity. Thursday, these are going to be our unknown compounds. I'm going to write half of them by their name and the other half by their formula. Okay? If I write them by their name, I want you to write their formula. If I write them by their formula, I want you to write their name. Okay? Um, I think there's about 12. Okay, so these are the ones that you'll actually be able to do. The other ones I'm writing up here, I'm going to write both the name and the formula because they're not ones that we've gone over on how to name. Okay, because they're, they're common names. Okay, so.
So we get 11. Close to 11. Okay, so what are we looking at is, actually, no, I'm going to give you a few minutes and see if you can get the names and the formulas down for those. Okay, and then we'll talk about each one of them. So for our first one here, we have hydrogen chloride, ionic or molecular. Hydrogen's listed first, behaving as a metal, so that's an ionic compound. But that's, hyd that's hydrochloric acid, we were talking about it before. Okay? It's a strong acid because it's made up of H plus and Cl minus. When I drop and swap, those cancel each other out, and I'm left with HCl. Okay? Ionic compound, hydrogen chloride. Okay? All right. Uh, our second one, I've got Na with OH. What is, N, uh, is this ionic or molecular? It's ionic. Sodium is a metal. Okay, so we're going to write sodium, and then what's this stuff? Hydroxide. Okay, it was the strong base we were talking about before. All right, so that stuff is sodium hydroxide. Do I need any Roman numerals on that ionic compound? No, sodium only has one possible charge. Okay. Then I've got CO with NO3, right? So I've got a polyatomic ion and a metal. What kind of compound is this? It's ionic, metal and a polyatomic ion, right? Anytime you got a metal, it's ionic. And I have a polyatomic ion. If you've got a polyatomic ion, you're definitely looking at an ionic compound. All right, CO stands for cobalt, okay? What does NO3 stand for? Nitrate. Okay, so I've written it like an ionic compound. Do I need Roman numerals for this one? Yes, I do. Cobalt can be a two or a three. Okay, so I've got to figure out which is which. So um, nitrate, according to my periodic table, is always a minus one. And I have how many of them? Two. Okay, so I've got two negative charges. That means the charge on cobalt must be plus two. Okay, I'm feeling like you guys are a little unsure right now about your naming. Okay, then we should definitely be practicing that tonight because guess what tomorrow's quiz is on? All naming. Okay, all of it. Okay, naming and, and formulas. Five, five questions of each, so we got to be ready for that. Okay, all right. Uh, next one here, we have the name ammonium nitrate. Okay, ammonium is a polyatomic ion, and it looks like this, NH4. Okay, what's its charge? Plus one, it's the only positively charged one on your chart. Okay, and nitrate, we just had above here, is NO3. And it's the minus one. So is that compound okay if I drop and swap it? Right, one and one, NH4, NO3. Okay. All right, copper two sulfate, ionic or molecular? ionic. Copper is a metal. Sulfate is a polyatomic ion. All right, so I'm going to go Cu. That's the formula for copper. And the Roman numeral tells me its charge is 2. Okay, and then sulfate is SO4. And it's got a minus 2 charge. So do I need to do anything with that compound? Is it okay the way it is? 2, two plus and 2 minus? There's my formula for copper 2 sulfate. All right, then I've got Ni with Cl, all right? Is this ionic or molecular? It's ionic, nickel is a metal, all right? So this is nickel, and it's with chlorine, so it's gonna be chloride. Do I need any Roman numerals? Yes, nickel can be a two or a three. Which one is it in this case? It's the two, because chlorine's a minus one, okay? So that means I need two positive charges from the one nickel that I have there. All right, what's H2O? Actually, just do this. It is the one thing I will let you use the common name for, okay? The H2O, water, okay? Water can actually also be written this way. Still two H's and one O, right? Okay. What's water's pH? Seven. It's perfectly neutral. And here's why. That's the thing that makes things acidic, 
This is the thing that makes things basic. basic. And it's got one of each. So they cancel each other out. Okay? If we were to write water like an ionic compound, that's what it would look like. All right. Um, and then we've got sodium chloride. Okay, that one's pretty straightforward. We all know that one. NaCl. Okay. All right. Now, let's look at what the properties of some of these might be. Okay, hydrogen chloride. So we said hydrogen was acting as a metal, and it's with chlorine. Okay, this is an ionic compound. So, um, will it dissolve in water? Should, right? Ionic compounds typically do. Okay, um, is it going to have any colors? Over the three metals that had colors. Nickel, cobalt, nickel, cobalt, and copper. Okay, so this is going to be clear. Right? Uh, because it has hydrogen in it acting as a metal, okay, is it going to have any extreme pH tendencies? Low, yeah. This will be a strong acid okay, because it has hydrogen acting as a metal. Okay. Will it conduct electricity in solution? Yes. Okay. Sodium hydroxide. Okay. So we got, again, a, an ionic compound, so it will dissolve in water. Will it conduct electricity? Yes. Okay. And because it's got this in it, it's going to be a base. Base. Yeah. All bases contain OH. All right. Uh, then I got cobalt nitrates, ionic or molecular. It's ionic. So will it dissolve in water? Will it conduct electricity? What color will it be? Copper's blue. Cobalt's pink, yeah, or red. Okay, so these are the things you have to ask yourself when we're going through our unknowns, okay, on Thursday. I'm looking at these unknowns. Okay, what are the properties of that going to be? Do I have anything in my list here of all the observations I made that matches that? And that's how you'll identify them. Okay, everyone kind of follow me there? Okay, that'll be the process. And you should be able to get them down, you know, to maybe you've got two that you're maybe not as sure about at the end. Okay? But you should be able to identify the vast majority of them pretty clearly. Right? And that's the process that you will go through. All right. We got eight minutes left in class today. I would like you working on. ones here. Okay, I think I can't remember which key number this is from last week. Okay, but this is in your digital workbook as well and you have a key for it. Okay, so I'd like you to write the formulas for let's say the first 10. Okay, so from 1 to 10 try and get those done. Right. I will be posting tomorrow's uh, like a quiz that's like what's going to be on tomorrow's quiz. I'll post that today after school. Okay, give that one a try, see how you do on it. Right. And, uh, That'll be, tomorrow's quiz will be five, where I give you the name and you write the formula. Five, where I give you the formula and you write the name. 